Hey y'all, welcome back for another episode of Synthesis with the School of Smirk, where we synthesize art and religion in order to allow everyone to utilize those two functions for their own benefit in their everyday lives. We show how art functions within the religious function, the function of religion for our species, how religion manifests in and is passed through art. And we do all this in a way that everyone can understand. We synthesize the two so that we can use each one to more access the other. And so that everyone of every type can use art, can use religion in order to most beneficially and most readily approach the world around them, their everyday life, the approachable mundane, um, in a way which is most beneficial for an interaction, most gratifying and meaningful. So today, um, we are going to synthesize Greek mythology, particularly looking into the transformation myth um, as an archetype, an archetypal structure, um, and as it's presented by Ovid, who presents the entire Greek god system and calls it the metamorphosis, meaning the transformation in Greek. Um, so I've identified in my own way the four fundamental steps, the skeleton of the structure, which allows for this type of myth to bring us through the entire metaphysical process, that which religion, well, that which embodies the religious function's achievement and um, how humanity experiences or could experience it. Um, and then we will combine those four steps in the Greek transformation myth with, so we'll synthesize them with um, Cezanne's artistic process as he describes it in his writing. So let's just let's just start get into it. Let's also I want I'm hoping to see how quickly I can offer some valuable information about these two and their synthesis, because it's when we understand one that we have more access to the other and more access to the other. That is religion and art. When we understand one or justify one, we have access to the other. and We can more readily comprehend the other because these things are integrally connected. They're inseparable. Um, they exist. They're inherent in each other. Um, and once we have more access to the other, we have confirmation of our understanding of the first one that led us to comprehend the other. So I'm going to see how quickly I can offer you an understanding of the, the Greek transformation myth. Um, first, I'll offer you uh, just a couple metaphysical premises in my own words, from my own perspective, um, about the function of religion. So, the and I offer these premises because if we look, if we listen to the lecture, if we look into the works with these in mind, it allows us to more readily perceive them, and it allows us to more readily perceive that which acts as the bridge um, to synthesizing the two. We see what pervades both of them, and this allows us to understand both of them better, how they're connected and how we can use them um, more, most readily. So the premises are infinity exists uh, in many manifestations, and humanity always takes account of it. That is, humanity has always taken account of indefinable, uncontrollable, unknowable, unforeseeable, 
um, factors and forces, dualities, paradox, enigma, limitlessness, endlessness. We've always taken account of all these things. Um, and at once, well, let, that's the first thing. There's an, we exist in a con context where infinity is uh, something and, and we notice it. Second is that humanity in particular, uh, what qualifies our species, what makes us particular, our species particularity, is a psychological one. It's a degree of consciousness, which consciousness is just the recognition of patterns and identifying them meaningfully to the self and to each other. So that's uh, how we can think of consciousness. Um, a consciousness which recognizes, identifies with, and finds meaningful relationship to the patterns not only of irrefutable particularity or uniqueness, we notice that each thing is absolutely specific. That's one of our things. We, we really notice that after childhood identification of 15 years of childhood identification with the world around us, we realize that we're irrefutably particular, and so is everything else. And uh, of course, this irrefutable particularity is a limitless specificity. It's an infinitely specific thing. And so there, there you go, another manifestation of infinity in our world. And yet this uniqueness, this specificity that we find and our consciousness understands as one of the meaningful patterns in the world seems to contradict this other pattern that we're less conscious about at that point, which we've recognized, taken account of the manifestations of the factors and forces and embodying, um, and that is infinity. So we find this irrefutable particularity we're very conscious of, our uniqueness, to be in contradiction to this endlessness or this bothness or this everything or this um, duality or this uh, indefinableness, this unknowableness and limitlessness. So we have infinity. We have consciousness as a recognition of patterns. We have our specificity as a species, as a consciousness, as having a consciousness which recognizes both uniqueness and infinity. And then we can understand that this, this condition, this state and nature of self, this specificity is what qualifies good or bad for us. It is our condition. It's also our opportunity. And so it's what is it's what brings about our our issues if these two awarenesses if the specificity of self about which we're designed and about which we're designed to receive from is not engaged so it brings about our issues it also brings about our just as much our, our benefit if they are engaged then we interact with the world around us with what we recognize we recognize infinity and in everything and specificity and everything if they're both engaged, then this is how we're nourished. This is what we're built to utilize and engage. It's what we recognize. And so it's what we are designed to receive from and in utilization of. Um, and so we see, uh, so have been um, developed functions like religion offering a path to justification of infinity within self, within a consciousness marked with uniqueness, and art as a, an abstract world, which is a means to expression, which allows infinity into process, into to be tracked and mapped, um, and to be discussed or reflected, guided towards, embodied um, in that abstract world. So let's let's get into it. That was a, a little preface that hopefully can help ground you, give you something to look for as I begin to explain these two manifestations, the one mythological and the other uh, a perspective on the artistic process. So so let's quickly go through the four steps of the transformation myth as Ovid presents um, 
the first step is that we are presented with a world in which exists gods. Um, examples of this transformation myth are Primus and Thisbe, are Alcyone and Sex, are um, Apollo and Daphne. And in all of these, we begin with we begin with seeing that there exists uncontrollable factors and forces. We see that there are these things that are beyond our control, just circumstances, let's call it fate, um, playing a role that people have and are aware, characters are aware of gods, that there, there are god systems of the past in play. Um, and so it is a world where these factors and forces exist, where gods or creations of god systems exists, where belief exists, and lastly, where there is love, where there is this experience, this idea that there's an importance um, of value to a sense of connection with some other, and that this becomes the most, that this could be the most important thing, that this could be unconditional. So we're presented sort of, the first step is that we're presented with the context, all of the variables which become important, which sort of the same way that I gave premises to this discussion, we're presented with the variables that we should keep an eye out for, that are going to be affected by and pervade and uh, the next four, the next three steps, and what essentially are being talked about. This is our subject matter, our themes, our topics. We're shown that there's something like love, which is actually a thought and a sense, an idea of being connected, um, which is very valuable. We're shown that uh, we're shown that another thing that's important is that people have and believe and want to believe in gods. They want to uh, abide oblige or abide by the, the rules of the gods or the god system, which they already know about um, and are willing to use this or are unwilling to change um, to act against it. That they feel a sense of reconciliation or want to feel a sense of reconciliation with some god system, some belief system. Then that there are factors and forces uncontrollable, that sex must go on despite their love he must take the risk and go on the journey. Um, there's some uncontrollable factor in force, the fact that Apollo has bound his control, fallen in love, and is pursuing Daphne. Um, well, just that he, that Cupid, <laughs> that Eros, Cupid, Cupid, has, um, has made him fall in love. So there's some uncontrollable factor in force. There is the existence of love unconditional and that this is, we're indicated this is valuable um, and that there's God systems. Um, and then step two is things are put into, uh, things, uh, again, un these uncontrollable factors and forces set the character who is aware of love's value and the benefits of it who is aware of the God systems and that they have some sort of function or potential that they exist and who have all the evidence they need, the existence of the dual or the boldness, the indefinable, the limitlessness, which are the manifestations of infinity. They're set into a difficult condition all of a sudden. Instead of living with their own belief that makes them feel comfortable in a sense of reconciliation um, and being in love and valuing that, unconsciously all of it they're now set into a predicament there is a conflict that's step, step two in this conflict um the character uh is like daphne being pursued um she's actually being challenged and trying to keep her chastity she doesn't want to be taken by Apollo, she doesn't want to go against 
her beliefs. Um, and she flees. She runs. She tries to take control of herself. Um, in the case of Alcioni, uh, she is extremely distraught because he has to go on his journey. He's forced to go away and their separation um, and her subsequent... She, she also attempts to um, perform sacred rites and make offerings, which gives her a sense of goodness. She's still engaged somehow with this idea of there being a god, but she starts to worry and she starts to try to take control of things for herself. And she's subject to her dreams and has um, falls into a paranoid state and um, or in the case of Prim and Thisbe, they decide to go to take things into their own hands. The conflict being that they're not allowed to love. They're, they go out into the woods and the arrival of something beyond their control, the lion, um, drives them to be physically separated. They try to take things into their own hands. There's The second step is essentially that the ego, in the face of antagonism, takes over. And it starts to try to, it struggles, it starts to try to control and manipulate um, in order to defend, to control, to limit, to define, to, to struggle against an ultimately uncontrollable set of factors and forces. The third step is when, at some point, the ego can no longer justify its role. That is, the character finds themselves in a situation where they no longer have any reason to believe they can control what's going on. Extreme circumstance. Um, Thisbe finds Paramus dead, bleeding out. Um, Kiparisos, another example, finds the stag, his beloved stag, bleeding out. Um, Daphne is chased to exhaustion by this god. She can no longer run. And in all these situations, these are ex extremes of circumstance. These are um, these are extremes of circumstance, and that's taken as the justification for the ego is simply the the fundamental truth of what we're seeing. The abstract relationship that we're seeing is that something, whatever it is, makes it so they no longer believe or have a reason to justify um, their ego as being that which is the deciding factor, that which they can rely on. Um, and it's exactly this which is what justifies their interaction with the beyond self. Um, so we can see that um, um, they find some reason. It's, it's extreme in the case of the story which is intentional because what happens during these tragic, unbelievably painful circumstances, which we can sort of foresee or wish that the characters can avoid, we experience the power of this, the energy that's coming from thousands of years ago when the stories were created. We're feeling the actual effect. We're gaining empirical evidence of the effect of energy itself interacting, of the creator themselves, thousands of years physically dead, alive interacting in this moment the energy equivalence and the interaction energetic as aliveness itself are both implications of the infinity that's being taught so anyways in the third step we we get a bit of that empirical evidence the turn of the the knife um and yeah the technique of the creator for sure but what happens is um for some reason, and it's because of the extremes of 
circumstance, this character, which didn't bring their gods, which didn't really truly interact with the god systems which existed sufficiently, which instead of relying on them, immediately went first to their first instinct, their ego, their immediate gratification, their, their wish to control and manipulate and um, exploit resources to control themselves, to preserve themselves, which is against the message that's being taught fundamentally. So, but eventually they're so exhausted or they've seen such horrible things that they realize they no longer have control. They are forced to see, and this is tragedy when we try to control for so long that all of a sudden beyond our control, invariably all the pieces are thrown up into the air and we have no choice about the matter. Eventually they find themselves in a situation where they know that they can't control it. It's so clear that it's beyond their control that suddenly they can justify letting the ego go. And it's when they do that, that they remember, oh yeah, there's this other way that it's always been suggested that we, um, that we can find help or salvation somehow. It's always been told to them and we knew that from the beginning that there's this God system and that we're supposed to pray to them or rely on them or give ourselves to them somehow or give ourselves to it or recognize or utilize it, this God system, this God thing somehow, this belief system. And it's at that point that that whichever character it is, begs to their god, whether it's Daphne's father, Canaeus, the river god, whether it's uh, Kiparisos, um, I believe it's the Sylvester, the god of, of the woods, um, or um, or or Thisbe, they they beg to the gods, they they give up, they they beg for whatever they need, whether it's, you know, to mourn forever for this sad thing that occurred, or they, uh, to, to be turned into a certain type of tree so they could it forever, um, they want to be able, they want to be immortal and to do what they believe is, is right, and they beg the gods for that. So at that point, and this is step four, three and four sort of combine here, but it's the point when the ego's quelled, albeit by extreme circumstances, and we're taught this because it's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be a choice that we're supposed to learn about this choice through the writing. But step four is that they finally give up. They begin to interact in a way which not only recognizes themselves, their physical self, their conscious awareness, what's good and bad, um, to be what they already know should be preserved and controlled, but also interacts with the beyond self. It starts to talk to the gods. It starts to talk to the beyond self, whatever is limitlessness in our world. They start to interact in a way which reflects reconciliation, infinity, and consciousness. As when they do that, they receive the sympathy of the gods. That is, when a person begins to interact with the world, somehow justifies, hopefully not by such extreme circumstances, when somebody is able to justify selflessness to act without the ego to come into interaction with the world in a way which knows that it includes infinity from the first step that they receive the sympathy or the benefit or the gifts or the giving from the gods that is they get the benefit of acting in a way the, ben the many benefits of acting in a way which reflects reconciliation reconciliation infinity and consciousness it should be that we manage without such extreme circumstances to reconcile infinity and consciousness and so come into an interaction which um, reflects it and therefore which is most beneficial and what happens for step completed is that the gods their sympathy transforms them into something else and gives them a mortal life that is it turns them into into the tree so they can have what they wanted so that they could feel right and do whatever that they thought was right or whatever they really truly wanted um, they're turned into the mulberry tree they're turned into the cypress they're turned into the kingfisher. Um, and what does this mean that they're turned into the into this thing? Well, when we come into an interaction that's selfless, when we do what's embodied as extreme circumstances being what's required to justify the removal of the ego, they no longer expect their ego to work, and so to beg to the gods. That is really, we should find some path 
to interacting with the world in a way which is selfless, which justifies that the ego is not the only thing, our conscious understanding is not the only thing, and knows that there's limitless potential in everything of every type, state, and nature. That's the implications of infinity. And when we do that, when we come into the interaction with the world like that, being all, all of us are in the step one situation, all of us are exposed to the invariable antagonisms and dissonances of life. But when we are in that second step exposed to that, if we just act as we do in the third, we just begin interacting with the world, even with the antagonisms, in a way which reflects infinity, which knows that it looks antagonistic, it looks dissonant, but it, like everything else, is an equally limitless potential for meaning. And so when we come into an interaction with everything, including step two things, antagonisms, in a way which is egoless, which is selfless, reflecting reconciliation of infinity and consciousness, we still have our uniqueness. We know that our consciousness is real and our awareness of our irrefutable particularity is real, but now we know that it's an irrefutably particular way of being related to an ever-changing infinite plexus of others. Um, and so when we come into an interaction with the world like that, we begin to interact with things like trees, like the stars, like other people, like rocks, stones, the philosopher's stone, animals, like a stag. We begin to interact with these things with that same love that we fell head over heels in, in the first step. This thing that's our potential, this unconditional giving, which in the first step and unconsciously is very is easy with those who are very easy to identify with someone who lives right on the other side of the wall like Pramus and Thisbe somebody who's just like you who's so easy to identify with and that allows us to give um, all of ourselves to them very quickly and nourishes us so much because that's the goal or that's the path to our nourishment is in fact it reflects infinity that we fall head over heels in love with them instead of falling head over heels another extreme circumstance that can be avoided in order to utilize what is what is obviously there. Um, we we use that we look at all these things the stone the tree the blah, 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 all these things without being forced to do so. Having reconciled infinity, we look at all of these others, the approachable mundane, the things in the world around us, in a way which has love, which knows that they are limitless, They all these things, whether they're antagonistic, dissonant, weird, foreign, enigmatic, strange, perfectly normal, just like us, totally different, inanimate, whatever they are, we interact with these in the way that the third step, the, the removal of the ego, somehow, allowed us to. We begin to give them all of ourselves. We begin to act with love. It's a, a type of focus. Um, it's called agape in Greek. And this is the focus, the complete giving, the breath of life given unto others, when we know ourselves and all other things, including them, to be praiseworthy, to be part of the same miraculous whole, to have all things of every type have equally limitless potential for meaning, value, truth, consequence. And so it's when we give that love from the first step uh, unto these others that we reveal our way of being irrefutably, particularly connected, related to them, only in that moment. And that's something that's witnessable to consciousness. It's uni unique light. It's the fruit of religion. It's the truth of self and other, which is the synerg psychoenergetic synergistic result that happens when we look into the cypress tree selflessly, somehow, when we use infinity to justify such behavior. And we reveal a new thought, a new meaning, a new way of our being connected. And that truth, what's revealed at that moment, it's not, a, it was selfless. It's us interacting with that other thing, which is also selfless. And the product of that interaction is always changing because we're always changing in the way of all things. All things irrefutably, particularly, are always changing because their truth is only their way of being related to ever changing things. And so what's revealed is whatever the product is of the self and the other thing. And that product can only happen in that moment because our self is changing and that thing is always changing. What is the product of that thing is a synergistic product, something we couldn't have created alone, nor it, but it becomes the consciously witnessable truth of the two. It's meaning connecting us. It's the thread 
of meaning which connects us in an infinite plexus. That is where air, ourselves, them, and everything else is treated as sacred. Air, pnevma, spirit, breath. This, when all things are treated as sacred, becomes the Holy Spirit. That is, it's endowed with the meaning which unites us. We are unique in that we're irrefutably connected to all other things in an ever-changing plexus. And um, as such, all two things have one thread that's connecting them. That is a shared aspect of their uniqueness. And so what we reveal, and this is the transformation, when we interact selflessly, when we interact in a way which reflects infinity, we reveal this meaning, which is its meaning and our meaning shared. One thread in the infinite plexus of relationships that we happen to share. And that makes part of my truth that same thing that's part of its truth. It's what happened when we interacted selflessly in that moment. And that transforms it into me and me into it. It's the revealing of limitless knowledge, limitless meaning and truth and consequence from specific things. We're ir both irrefutably particular, but our way of being related is always changing. So our irrefutable particularity is a way of being related, which is always changing. A uniqueness, a specificity, which is limitless. In the next moment, if I approach the same other with the same selflessness, with agape, with unconditional love, having justified in self, the implications of infinity, knowing that it's always changing, knowing that we're both part of the miraculous wholeness, oneness, then this will continue to be revealed. There's a limitless uh, potential there. So what happens then is that we transform. We've become the tree, the tree has become us, and we have this meaning. This meaning which we can then put into story, which we can then put in art, which we can then express as our unique light see how it affects everything else in the world, all these new meanings, values, how it affects our entire universe, rebirth into this um, place of new meanings and values by this newness which has arrived from that selfless interaction. And that is what we can put into art as the word or any other type of creation preserved and pass on to posterity to re truly interact as our energy, the equal, equally real truth of self as our physical, to interact and so be immortalized, to come into interaction, into life, as any type of interaction is life itself and infinity, uh, with all of posterity. So we see that ideas like releasing the ego, coming into an interaction which reflects recognition of the beyond self, that there exists love, that these are all potentials which are always there these are things which everyone experiences or knows about some way somehow from some angle or degree in some degree um, and that most commonly they're not utilized they're not engaged um, most commonly when we fall in love it's we, we don't know why and we don't know what to do with that love most commonly when Oh, bunny rabbit. Most commonly when uh, we face antagonism, we flee from it. We attempt to control and isolate and limit and define it as bad and to, to run away from it. We try to maintain and preserve, despite knowing about these gods which tell, which tell us that's not the way to be. You should love everything. You should treat everything equally. You should be selfless in the face of anything. You should be fearless. And we see that there's the potential to be egoless. There are reasons and there's ways to choose. There are factors and forces which make it clear that ultimately the ego is not the end-all be-all, that it can't control everything, that there are uncontrollable factors and forces, that we live in a place where infinity is manifest. And so that that's not the thing to rely on, that we don't need to push ourselves to these extremes of condition in order to realize that it is not the only way. In order, we don't need to be pushed to these extremes in order to finally justify using this other thing, which we always recognize from the beginning, along with the love, that there are 
there is all of this beyond us, that we're able to come into an interaction with the world around us, which utilizes, which reflects, which takes into consideration and uses the implications of the infinity and its manifestations that we recognize. That if we do that, all of a sudden, we have the sympathy of the gods or the support of the gods. That is, we have the support of this additional aspect of self, this additional aspect of consciousness, our awareness that things are, are specific. They are what creates the ego and the consciousness of uniqueness. They are specific. Everything's your peculiar particularity. But there's also this indefinableness, this limitlessness, this endlessness, this inf infinity, but that those two can both be used that we can exist with our ego, that we can have our consciousness, but that it's not the thing to always rely on. That if we also approach each thing, knowing that it's ultimately limitless, then when antagonism arises, we can love it the same way that we loved that person that was so easy to identify with, that was just like us, spoke the same language, was the fairest beauty in the East, that lived right across the wall, that was family friends, so easy to identify with. And that selflessness, that's so easy in that case, we can choose to use knowing and believing, having some way, having found some way using the religious function to justify interacting according to the implication of infinity, that all things of every type, state, and nature have an equally limitless potential for meaning, value, truth, and consequence. And when we do, we come into interaction with things, the world around us, the ocean, the stars, the animals, the stones, the trees, and that interaction that selfless interaction, the one that chooses, that understands that the value in love, the reason why we fall in love is because we have a reason to be selfless and selflessly attempt to identify and connect with others. That we shouldn't just rely on there being the fairest beauty in the East on the other side of the wall who happens to like us too. That there is this focus, this power, and there's paths to this love, that there's justification for loving all things of every type just as we were sort of effortlessly led to love that one because it's when we give that selflessness and we give that complete focus that arises the reason why we fell head over heels in love what arises is this unique light this manner of being irrefutably particularly related to another that reconciles us in the whole that gives us a sustainable path to connection with the other that transforms us the metamorphosis into the other by gaining a shared truth. And that redefines us. That redefining us, gaining new meaning, showing us part of what we irrefutably particularly are in that moment, which is the only truth because what was in the last moment no longer is. This is an addition to that. This is the truth now. And so that relieves us of self-doubt. It sustainably connects us. It reconciles us with the indefinable, uncontrollable factors and forces by showing us part of our way of being particularly connected in the infinite. And then, having received that newness, allows us to watch all things redefined in light of it, as all things are only what they are by relationship. So a newness would imply that all things are redefined. And as this newness is consciously witnessable, so we could watch our consciousness can witness how all things change by using consciousness, a consciousness which includes infinity, to allow the self to interact with all things in a way that is beyond our control, beyond self, and so we use consciousness to allow our consciousness to witness a higher self, a more meaningful self, one that's interconnected, and so to be transformed and to gain the opportunity to be immortalized by spreading the light that we receive, this unique light, through art. So that's the transformation myth. Um, course failed to keep it short I just can't seem to do that okay so now that we have my premises we have these four steps to Greek transformation myth hopefully we could begin just begin by touching on Cezanne's uh, steps and since we have all of this all of these ideas and start starting to see how we're, we can connect the dots we can see relatively quickly um, uh, 
how they are sort of mapped onto his process. So the first is is the the motive, um, what he would call motive, and this is his interaction with the world itself, his observation of his subject. Um, let's call it a, la a, a landscape, everything in a landscape. The idea was one of pure vision. That is, he would come into an interaction with the world, which was not assuming or predefining, but looked with a sort of pure optical experience just to see exactly what was there. That is, to look selflessly. Um, it could be understood as a rigorous scrutiny, but we could also see that infinity, just like just like the love that could be accidental or the egolessness or the interaction with the beyond can be all accidental sort of forced into the situations. So can this selfless look, looking selflessly un unto others. He, he thought of this as a rigorous scrutiny, the need to come into an interaction which didn't limit things. Uh, he perceived it as um well he he managed it by creating something that unified everything of course infinity would do the same thing um he understood that there was a central point and that is actually a path to relating all things by making a central point by seeing by helping pure vision that is by look help by assisting ourselves in looking selflessly, removing the ego, by putting a central point to which all things can be related. We look at the world according to the implications of infinity. We look at things as if they are all irrefutably particular, fundamental relationships um, that are ever-changing. We see things as relationships, not as predefined things, as pure relationships to each other. So he manages... Um, the selflessness, which is sometimes comes from ease of identification, sometimes comes from having reconciled infinity through this um, this manner of treating optical phenomena. He he said, okay, if I'm going to understand what this thing is, if I'm going to really interact with it, which he knew required a selflessness, required removal of the ego, it required a pure vision, as he called it, he would have to create a central point. The central point allowed him to see the relationships, fundamental truths about each of these things. Then, also, another uh, sort of, another unifying uh, tactic, another way to get the self to look in a way which also would reflect infinity, if we were just able to justify that, um, was by understanding things in the spectrum from black to white. All colors, shades, um, and so this extreme of context allows an infinite uh, amount of subtlety, all related to these extremes of context. If we create a structure like black and white, day and night, one end and the other, we are able to see inside of that how everything is related. So he manages in the motive to accomplish the same degree of interaction, albeit by some sort of rigorous scrutiny. Um, a, a seeking of truth, a demanding of rigorous observation of optical phenomena. Then, he says, occurs sensation. When he looked in this way upon things, when he used all of his energy, gave the breath of life from my metaphysics, in order to observe to interact with what was there with the world around it that is he sort of indirectly interacted with the world according to the implications of infinity as the mythological character is forced to when they're in extreme circumstances or finally justifies doing in super extreme circumstances when they don't no longer believe that their ego can help them um once he does that once he comes into just somehow he justifies through this, uh, these unifying manners of dealing with optical phenomena, he then receives the sensation that is the unique light. He experiences by his second step, his observation, 
and sketching of everything. He receives the unique light, which is the sensation, the irrefutably particular way of his being connected to what is there, having looked at it selflessly, a, a sensation which is going to change in every moment, a unique light redefining that which, having given the breath of life, he breathes in, inspires. He is inspired by this otherwise impossible truth, having arisen from the same mountain range he may have looked at for decades. He gets a sensation from his interaction in that unique moment. And it's by acting in a way which reflects infinity, albeit he sources it and phrases it and justifies it through a demand for pure vision. And so he reveals a sensation, which is the other thing that he's going to pass. He's going to bring into his creation process that which it is, irrefutably particular relationships between things as their truth, his irrefutably particular relationship to all of those things as the unique light, which he calls a sensation, the fruit of religion, that which was gained, that which redefines the self and this whole world, and he brings that into process. The third step, realization. Here, he enters into the process of creation. He has to represent his unique light, the effect of this newness, the appearance of this newness, the relative meaning of how this newness appeared to him, what it meant, its effect on the values and truths, the meanings and purposes and functions, the appearances of all things in this same world that he always knew, but as it appears and redefines all of them and himself. And so as he puts forth the irrefutably particular relationships of the motive, that which is seen as pure vision, optical phenomena observed with, a, with unifying factors, in in an abstract world which has a oneness in it, just as we would observe something in a way which reflects infinity. So he um, he represents that. He gives us what he saw, exactly. And then, using color, that's his means to expression. Um, in, in music, this could be harmony, it could be uh, directions, it could be pitch, register, um, arrangement, or orchestration. Um, in in writing, it could be characters in certain contexts um, with certain attributes, um, going through certain experiences that had to do with certain psychological phenomena, etc. There's in every different art, there's means to expression. That is, there are abstract variables between which can be created isomorphic relationships, fundamental relationships, property and quality holding between abstract variables. So he uses color in order to represent, to bring out, to show these new meanings and values, these fundamental relationships, irrefutably particular between things, which are the result of his selfless interaction, which are in addition to what is fundamentally there that he observed, which, what, which, which arise on top of, in addition to redefining the self and the other when he observed the other selflessly in the way that reflects infinity, in a way which includes a unifying factor which includes this idea, which treats things with this idea that all are somehow one or related. And so he enters into this process, and the thing is, and this is where he just slightly lacked, um, he always felt that this was a great risk and was concerned um, with this realization, how to combine these two things. And that's exactly where we find the reconciliation of art and religion. It's exactly where we find our bridge between the two. That is, he used another path, which he, he could, we could have just reconciled infinity and come into an interaction with the world like this that revealed the fruit of religion. Could have just treated his his motive, the thing that he was looking at, in a way which reflects the implications of infinity, 
got the unique light, his sensation. But because it was slightly unconscious, because it wasn't, because he didn't know that the art was his acting like a religious, no, no. he was acting like somebody who had reconciled infinity and consciousness, and that's why he was so inspired and nourished, why he was so connected to nature and knew the value of treating the things around him this way. But he thought the source was art was his technique in painting. In fact, all of this happened because he happened to find a way through art to interact in the way that reflects infinity. And so if he knew it, then he would enter into the process in a way which knows that the abstract variables and relationships, having removed them from the interaction of self with the physical world, physical self, physical world, instead of this interaction in the immediate, once you remove it, if you knew, if he had had the implications, if this had started from the religious side instead of the artistic side, he would have entered into process knowing that in that process, you're still in the life experience, still in the life process, which in which it is implied that all things there, now abstract variables and abstract relationships, have an equally limitless potential for meaning, consequence, and value that it's in the abstract world that we treat and must that it's implied that we should treat things exactly the same as in the mundane physical world that there too again now even in their abstract form even represented as abstract variables and relationships they too have an equally limitless potential that their truth a truth which he's trying desperately to preserve he's painstakingly rigorously attempting to take this miraculous light that he revealed this otherwise impossible thing that redefined him was so nourishing. And he's trying really hard to represent exactly like it was, but it's exactly that attempt at control in the face of the indefinableness of a process that's still going on. As he creates, he still lives in a world where he cannot control everything, where there's indefinableness. And so he finds that there's a risk there, He, but actually it stimulates his ego. It's if he took all of that and got into process and in that process continued and he did he achieved he achieved this he was just very concerned about it but um and and we see this especially in end, his writing towards the end of his life and career that um he began to see that the painting process would take a life of its own of, because he allowed it to once you enter this process and also realize that just like the world itself the abstract variables and relationships are equally potential holding real consequential true things that their truth their uniqueness is also an irrefutably particular way of being related to each other and related to the self that is also ever-changing that its conditions the conditions of itself the conditions of myself Sure, fundamental pro properties preserved, relationships preserved and definite, but those are ever changing in their way of being related to everything else. And so it's when we enter into that process with the sensations, the unique light, the irrefutably particular patterns, properties recognized, preserved, and the self, and know that all of them are changing, that we then enter into a process which reflects the process itself reflects the inclusion of the beyond self into its execution. And this is when, as we create, as we interact with the things that we are attempting to regurgitate, we again are allowing into that process, just as we did. We are treating things according to the implications of infinity. We're allowing the beyond self. We're allowing these variables and relationships to interact with us again in a way which redefines both of us. That is sensation to pile on top of sensation. And it's when this happened that the world which he saw, which he treated in a way reflecting infinity, albeit by something more like a rigorous scrutiny, a pure vision of optical phenomena, led to those sensations when he brought those two, the, that unique light, then again into a new into a new world, just like he could have if he kept interacting with the world, he would have 
kept and used those meanings and spread that light, seeing all things redefined. So going into the abstract context, he sees that unique light um, again interacting anew. That it's not about preserving the unique light. The value is not in the sensation, in the unique light, the fruit of religion. It's not in the thing itself. It's not in that immediate appearance that there is the value. The value is, is in its newness. The value for us is that we've revealed a we've revealed the only thing in that moment, which is our irrefutably particular way of being related. It's valuable because it's it's a meaning that's additional. It completes the self. It removes self-doubt. It connects us sustainably to the other. This is how it transforms us into the tree or the constellation or the the creature. Um it redefines us because it's new and that then allows us to see as all things are redefined it brings us into this higher aliveness this higher interaction with the world around us and this is incredibly uh nourishing and that's the thing that we like and so he brought the sensation he brought that very nourishing thing and tried to preserve it in the work but we have to realize that it's not the sensation of course the sensation was there and he could preserve that in the work that is unique light he can show how it affected what he saw when he interacted in a way reflecting infinity pure vision with the, the physical world but he also has to show the unique light that is revealed if it's going to be realized if it's going to include infinity and that is it's going to have lightning in the bottle if it's going to be art if it's going to include infinity irrefutable particularity it's also going to have to include the result of selfless interaction with the abstract variables and relationships in the process of creation, which is part of life itself. It's just as real as an interaction as was out there, and the only way it's going to be nourishing, the only way it's going to be realized, the only way it's going to be valuable is if it includes also the irrefutably particular truth that's again changing in each moment during the process of creation, realization. Okay, well, thank you for joining me. Uh, I hope that wasn't too confusing. I hope we can. this can help us start to see how religion, the metaphysics that I offer, uh, the function of religion, metaphysical premises, uh, God systems like mythology, which are told using the means to expression called art, and art itself as something which sometimes appears to be separate from or stands alone from religion is actually a function within religion. It's actually the means, the particular means for humanity to include infinity into process, into product, um, to track it and map it and to discuss or share its effects, its sources, um, its manifestations and potentials. Um, yeah, thanks for joining the School of Smirk um, for another episode of Synthesis and uh, we'll be back soon.